Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Conservatives Cool Talk Radio. This is your host, Wayne Bradley. I want to thank everyone for listening tonight. This is my first Fix Michigan Monday, and I appreciate everybody that's listening in tonight. I have a guest with me who is very familiar with Michigan and what we need to do to make it better, the former chairman of the Michigan GOP, Saul Anuzis, and I, I'm, I'm bringing him on the show right now, so thank you everybody that's listening in, and here's Saul. Hey, Wayne, how are you? How you doing, Saul? How are you doing this evening? We're doing great, thank you. Great, great. For everyone that's listening in, uh, that I'm very familiar with you. Could you give people a little bit of your background? Obviously, being the former chairman of the Michigan GOP, can you give us a little background on what's going on right now? Sure. Uh, obviously, I you know I served four years at the at the Michigan GOP as a chairman, and then I ran for the national chairman this year uh, in uh, February of this year and uh, lost to Michael Steele. Uh, there were six candidates running and. Uh, I went up to the fifth ballot, came in third place, and dropped out on the fifth ballot, and Michael Steele won on the sixth. Um, and uh, since then, I've been helping out uh, both. I served on the transition team and uh, agreed to help out where I was appointed as chairman of the technology committee for the uh, RNC. So I'm helping with the national committee as we try to move into kind of the 21st century from a technology standpoint and make sure that we're ready for the next election cycle. Uh, I'm also serving on the Presidential Rules Committee for the Republican National Committee, which will set the nominating process up for 2012. So we're hoping uh, by statute we have to finish, by rule actually, we have to finish that up by July of this summer. So we'll uh, have the final timetables and rules set for nominating the Republican uh, nominee uh, on the presidential side. And then I'm just, uh, you know, still working on my business, uh, Coast to Coast uh, Strategies is a um, basically, business development and strategic planning uh, group. We work with uh, I work with the House of Representatives. I work with the RNC. I've got some uh, private uh, industry clients, uh, both in insurance and elsewhere. So, um, you know, pretty busy guy. Travel around the country and and uh, in and out of Michigan on a on a regular basis as well. Wow, they sound very busy. I, I appreciate you coming on the show tonight. Uh, obviously, the um, the topic tonight is fixing Michigan. Um, and there's a lot of things that tie in nationally with what's going on right now uh, that, you know, we have our problems here in Michigan. Um, you know, being from this state, what do you think uh, What do you think are some of the things that are hurting Michigan right now? Uh, well, I, I, think, I think in general, if you take a look at the business climate here and you take a look at what, you know, Jennifer Granholm has done over the eight years, I mean, one of the big frustrations that I think Republicans have had uh, is, you know, the state Senate passed a balanced budget here for the last several years in a row. I mean, the Constitution requires it, but it passed one basically looking at making some structural reforms. And constantly the Democrats and Governor Granholm pushed back on that. We shoved through the largest tax increase in Michigan's history about three years ago. Michigan right. is a high-tax state. We're a highly regulated state. And, you know, we've lost some 500,000 people. We're going to lose an entire congressional seat in Michigan, which will take away our cloud at the federal level. Um, you know, we've had people, uh, you know, basically immigrating outside of our state, uh, heading off back, whether they came from the south during the uh, early, you know, auto years, um, you know, and folks are just leaving Michigan. So I think we've got to make Michigan more competitive again. If you take a look at statistically, 68% of all the kids in college have said they plan on looking out of state to find a job. Well, that's a tremendous drain on our future. Uh, that is the hope of our future is our, our sons and daughters and grandchildren who are going to colleges here. You know, arguably we've got some of the best colleges and universities in the country, and unfortunately the kids who graduate here can't find a job here. What what could we do to make Michigan uh, a better place to do business as far as um, enticing new businesses to come here? What are some of the things that we could do? Well, about? yeah, first of all, I think we have to be uh, competitive with respect to our business climate. Uh, we have to create a situation where businesses that are currently located here and those who are looking at expanding somewhere would want to come to Michigan. So I think, you know, one of the number one things we have to do is to stabilize our tax base, make sure that people understand that, uh, you know, what kind of taxes we're going to have and that they are competitive with our neighboring states. Uh, when we talk about people, you know, going south of the border, many of them are going to Indiana and Ohio and Illinois. It's not all the way down to Mexico. Um, literally, we have our neighboring states that are taking businesses away. Um, you take a look at a state like Indiana, for example. They have what's called shovel-ready permitting. 
you can literally go in and say, I want to build a, you know, 100,000 square foot office building, or I need to build a 50,000 square foot light manufacturing plant. And in Indiana, they'll give you a list of properties that already have been approved at the local county and state level for permitting. And literally within 48 hours, you can put a shovel in the ground and start constructing on specific projects. Well, it's that kind of attitude that I think makes a difference. Um, I worked in the state Senate back when uh, Governor John Engler was in charge, and, you know, he used to make commitments, uh, you know, to making Michigan a friendly state. We used to have unemployment below the national average. And literally, if somebody were to come in the state and say we were considering expanding here, we would bend over backwards to bring in new jobs, to bring in uh, more tax revenues in effect, and, and you know, making you know, Michigan a better place to do business. So I think, number one, we've got to deal with the tax structure. Number two, from a regulatory standpoint, I mean, we have a fairly uh, intrusive regulatory pro uh, policy. Um, you know, we tell people where, where and what they can do under what circumstances. Right. Uh, much of it is related to union work rules. I think one thing we ought to very seriously consider here in Michigan is making it a right-to-work state. Uh, I think that by giving workers a choice of whether they want to belong to a union or not is the right thing to do. Uh, there are some 20-some states in, the, in, in this country that give union workers or give workers a choice. And so you can join a union if you want to, but if you don't want to, you're not forced to join a union. And here in Michigan right now, if you want to work in certain companies, you're forced to join the union. You don't have the choice. And I think having that choice, uh, giving the workers that choice, would be very important. And that would make us more competitive. And you see oftentimes jobs going to states that give workers a right. Because if, you know, I've, I've been in several factories here in Michigan where I've, you know, visited where there are nine union shops. In effect, uh, they're competing with union uh, shops right down the street. They they provide you know similar wages and similar benefits, but most of them have to do with work rules that are you know sometimes you know unrealistic. So I think that um, it's another way of making Michigan more competitive. Um, I think we have to take a look at the job training. You know, uh, not everybody is necessarily destined to go to college. We have a lot of high skilled labor jobs in Michigan uh, that require uh, extra education, but it may be vocational training. It may be you know, the electricians or the carpenters or the plumbers. And, again, those things don't necessarily mean you go to college, but you may go to a vocational school for a year or two to, to learn a specific trade. And right. if you take a look at uh, CAD CAM designers or HVAC people or electricians, uh, we've got folks who could be making sixty to $100,000 plus um, that, you know, there have been times when our economy has been booming that we've tried to bring people in from, you know, other states and even from Canada to just to do, you know, to fill in work. Right. Uh, you also take a look at our medical system. You know, we've got one of the best medical uh, centers in the country, uh, whether it's anywhere from the Carmanos Institute in Detroit to the Van Andel Institute in Grand Rapids that does, you know, state-of-the-art research. Uh, you know, the University of Michigan's medical center, I mean, Michigan State University is expanding their hospital, building a new hospital in Grand Rapids. So, you know, we're a pretty diverse state. I think if we were to be a little more competitive and competitive with our neighbors, um, we could we could make a difference here. Right. I, you know, when you, you touched upon with the unions, and, I, and I, that's the, I guess that's one of the questions, being from the Detroit area, and I'm, just, you know, I'm always conscious of that, how much do the unions affect, even with some of the other jobs, like you just named with electricians, how much do they affect, uh, the, you know, how much do they affect making companies stay away from doing business in Michigan, knowing, that, like you said, in southern states where you have the right to work, uh, you know, right to work laws where it allows you to choose or not to join a union? How much do you think that really does affect, uh, you know, them choosing between Michigan and say another state like in, in Georgia? Well, there's no doubt it does, and it's not just the South. I mean, you know, right to work states are across the country, uh, although most of them are, are are concentrated in the southern states. But it, it does make a difference. I mean, there are there are companies that uh, uh, even you know Governor Granholm and this administration went after, and they basically said, you know, if if we're forced to uh, bring on a union, we're not gonna you know we're not gonna come in here. And some of the auto manufacturers, are, when they're looking at expansion, some of the suppliers, when they look at expansion, uh, it just doesn't make sense to do it here in Michigan because, and and most of the time, it's not a function of salaries, it's not a function of benefits, it's a function of the work rules. Um, there are certain factories uh, and certain manufacturing facilities that maybe have three or four or five uh, sets of categories for the workers and make sure people are cross-trained so they can do two or three different jobs. Where in, in many of the factories around Michigan, 
uh, because of labor laws, there may be as many as 38, 36, even as high as 60 work classifications, so that if you're working in one line, you can't go over to the other line, or if you're supposed to be picking up a box, you can't, you know, pick up a shovel, et cetera. And it's those kind of unrealistic work rules that make it very difficult. And then when times do get tough, the other problem is, you know, if you take a look at state employees, uh, unionized state employees right now, I mean, we really do have to restructure the way Michigan uh, provides its services. I mean, we are now over the last eight years collecting 25% less in state revenues than we did in the past. And part of that means we have to downsize the state government, downsize how we deliver government. And when you have uh, strong public sector unions that won't let you, you know, cut back on employees, shut down facilities, um, you know, uh, basically, you know, fit the size of our government, um, you really force us into a position of looking at raising taxes. And I think that's that's where kind of the, the quandary comes in for Michigan taxpayers is that we know we need to live within our means. We have a constitutional requirement to balance our budget, yet we have some limitations that make it very, very difficult for us to uh, make some of those structural reforms. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to fire a bad teacher. Uh, right. which I think is, you know, outrageous. Um, you know, we have 500 and some different uh, school uh, systems in Michigan. Um, why do we need so many? I mean, that's what school boards are for. Uh, you know, even if we went down to counties, we could take it from 500 down to 83. Uh, and, you know, you don't even need that many because, I mean, many of these counties are relatively small and they don't need to have that, those kind of school systems. So, so was, you know, we was... have a lot of duplicity and a lot of waste in there. That was, that was one of the questions I was going to ask about the education issues. Do you think one of the best routes to reduce some of that government spending in schools is to, uh, you know, maybe more closings and consolidating of the of the counties and the units of the schools? Well, I think, yeah, I think the administrative bureaucracies are one place that clearly we can save a lot of money. Um, it, it does not make sense for us to have, you know, a bureaucracy on top of 500 different school districts. Number two, I think, you know, increasing our schools of choice uh, options, making right. sure that we have more charter school options available. Uh, in effect, they're still public schools, but they're competing with one another. So if you want to go to an engineering school or you want your child to go to an engineering school, you can send them there. If you want them to learn languages, you can go to a specialty language school uh, or other, other interests. Uh, Henry Ford um, Museum has set up a school for Ford Motor Company with young engineers looking at, at doing things. There are um, ethnic-centric uh, schools that are set up. Uh, so you, you can basically tailor them uh, to meet a student's needs, to meet a family needs, and to meet our community needs. Right. And I think that that makes a tremendous amount of sense. And so, you know, schools of choice, uh, charter schools, uh, less, less um, uh, kind of administrative uh, overhead, uh, coming up with uh, more efficiencies with respects to how we deliver these services. You know, you take a look at, for instance, uh, bus service. You know, if we privatize our bus drivers and bus services in, in, in most school districts, they're, they're seeing savings at somewhere between 20 to 30 uh, percent. Those are significant savings that can go to classrooms and books and computers rather than paying for bus drivers to sit around and wait for the kids to get out of school. And there are services that will handle that for you. Uh, the same thing comes true with janitorial services. You're better off hiring, you know, your Molly maid, so to speak, in the local area, in the local cleaning company that will be much more efficient than having, you know, full-time employees that are paid by the school districts uh, that eat up and benefits and retirement benefits and basically have no, you know, no direct correlation to teaching your kids how to read, write, and do arithmetic and compete in the modern world. And I suspect again, you'll find that the root of this is a lot of the unions that control these a lot of these issues because sure, uh, some of in, in some schools, you know, that's where they get a lot of the fight back is with the uh, unions. Absolutely, I mean, and, and you know, they, once you've created a a kind of a group of jobs, and the unions come in and protect these jobs, and you know, it sounds good that they're protecting, you know, they're protecting jobs, but they're protecting jobs at the expense of children at education at taxpayers i mean uh, like anything else you know we you know most people have to try to live within their means and and most people do and uh, that means that sometimes you cut back and you don't have all the services and you can't give yourself you know the 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 luxuries that you may want and and uh, you might have to you know drive that car a year or two longer and you might not go on that vacation that you were planning on or drive instead of fly etc and those are all choices that we as you know people in our homes have to make Yet, uh, oftentimes in the school systems and in government in particular, 
uh, they're constantly looking at, you know, the, some of the most expensive ways of doing things, and it's uh, they just haven't caught up with the reality that we just don't have the tax revenues that we used to have, and we ought to be more efficient. It, 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 does, it amazes me that, um, you know, like you said, we have to make these personal decisions at home with this kind of responsibility, but the government so far is just not showing any signs of doing that. Um, in, in the state of Michigan, our unemployment rate is at 14.3%. Um, would, would you say that that's our, probably our biggest issue in Michigan and not not the health care debate? Oh, there's no doubt. Look, I mean, this is all about jobs, jobs, jobs. I think there's nothing more important. And if you listen to, as an example, the Republican candidates all running for governor, we've got a bunch of very strong candidates, and all of them are talking about jobs and how do we create jobs, how do we create a, an environment that creates jobs, how do we deal with the state government that allows for an environment to create jobs, because in the end, if we have more jobs, if we have more people who are employed, there will be more people paying taxes, and that means there will be more money to spend to educate our children better and to provide the services that many people have grown to expect. And so, look, we, there's a certain role that we all believe government should play, but we want it to be efficient. We want it to be effective. We want it to be cost-effective. And that means that, you know, you need responsible leadership. And sometimes it means you've got to make some of the tough decisions, and we just can't do things the way we used to do them. But I think that's the frustration is that people want to see more jobs. And, you know, you look at this health care debate. I mean, what, what President Obama is proposing today, and, I mean, a lot of it we don't know because the, the bill, the, the, they don't kind know. Of the shell bill was passed or released last night. We still don't know what's in a lot of it. But we do know that even, according to the Democrats, it's going to cost us a trillion dollars. That's a trillion dollars that we don't have. Right. We currently have made a commitment to Social Security. We have not funded it. We have to borrow against it every single year. We have a Medicare and Medicaid programs that we've committed to that are unfunded liabilities. Again, we're borrowing money against that every single year. So we can't even pay for what we've already committed with respect to, you know, arguably valuable and useful social programs that may or may not be very efficient. But the point is we've already committed to those. We can't even pay those. And right. then, you know, President Obama and the Democrats want to put another one on top of that. Well, so how, how would pay if, for it? If this bill, uh, obviously they don't know what's in the bill because Pelosi said it herself. We have to pass it first to see what's right. in the bill. Find out what's in it. Um, how could if this bill did pass? How could this uh, affect Michigan? Uh, would our, you know, temporarily, would our premiums go up? How would, would that in, uh, would it improve health care in Michigan, or would open? What would be some of the better solutions for uh, to, for health care mm -hmm. issues well, in Michigan? Well, look, if you take a look at it, first of all, I, th I think the biggest frustration for people is that this will require um, folks to buy insurance. If you don't have insurance now, you're going to be required to buy it. And there's a question of whether or not that's even constitutional. So right. one of the issues that we'll see right off the bat is, a, is a, probably a, a fight that will go right into the courts to see if it's constitutional to require people to buy insurance. Secondly, if you take a look at other states who have actually come up with uh, forms to have their entire population is insured. Uh, you know, one of the things we all talk about is how expensive it is for the indigent poor to go into emergency rooms that oftentimes because they don't have health care, they go to a hospital because the hospitals will cover them. Well, what we found is that there was several private studies that have been done that basically show that even after they're covered with insurance, they continue to go to the hospital because it's more convenient. Right. Um, they can't get an appointment with their doctor. It doesn't show up fast enough. So if they go into the emergency room, yeah, they may have to wait a couple hours, but it gets taken care of that day rather than having to wait several weeks to do something. So there's still there's still some problems in the you know with the process, even if you have a fully insured constituency. Um, the other thing is, you know, look, the way we ought to handle this is make it more affordable, lower lower the costs uh, by allowing for you know interstate sales. Uh, so you can shop your insurance anywhere in the country. There's insurance companies that are allowed to compete. Right now, there's actually government-mandated government either monopolies or oligopolies where only a couple companies are allowed to sell insurance in Michigan. So right. if you wanted to buy it from a company in Indiana or Ohio, uh, you couldn't do it. The other right. thing is we've got to allow flexibility. Um, a single male uh, at the age of, say, 26 is going to have a very different requirement for health insurance than somebody at the age of 56. And a female, obviously, is going to have different requirements than a male. And we haven't really allowed for that flexibility. We've set, the, and again, government mandates tell people what they have to buy, how much they have to buy, what insurance companies have to offer. And oftentimes, we're buying insurance that 
really is not relevant to us. Right. Um, you know, we've gotten into coverage. For everybody in America, it just sounds ridiculous if everyone's not going to be using it. You know, a lot of young people. Right, and I mean, look, we ought, to, we, ought to have, we ought to have choices, and we also want to make it more market, uh, you know, based. I mean, you know, there was, a, there was a study a couple of years ago about somebody who went in for um, a heart um, uh, valve transplants, and, and I think it was either in Flint or Saginaw, uh, maybe I think it was Flint. Uh, they said there was three hospitals that actually could handle the surgery, and it was literally like a thirty thousand dollar difference uh, between the different hospitals and in, in, in the charges. And you know, right now we go in there with insurance, and we really just say, "Here, do it," because we don't have to pay attention. But if all of a sudden you had more medical savings accounts, if you had higher deductibilities, if you basically, you know, uh, let consumers be more aware of what are you paying for, how much does it cost, how can you save money. Uh, let even people put money in their pockets. It would make a lot more sense uh, than, you know, just basically saying go in there and, and get your coverage. I mean, you drive through Detroit because of the auto industry uh, in October when the, when the fiscal year is ending for insurance, oftentimes you'll see billboards up there that says, have you gotten your second pair of glasses this year? They're free, so go get them. Well, they're free to the policyholder, but they're not free to society. They're not feel free to the company. So because they have decided to give you two pairs of glasses instead of one pair of glasses, sometimes people need them because they break or something happens. But the reality is, is there's an incentive to go get a second pair, even if you don't need it. Right. And people throw them in their, you know, in their drawers and hang on to them because, you know, they could get them anyway. Um, you know, my mother at 83, uh, you know, we went in and they said, oh, they ought to get a hip replacement, you know, make her, you know, feel better. I mean, it was an expensive surgery. And the reality is... She you know, she wasn't walking much and already had Alzheimer's, but because it didn't cost me anything, I said, sure, yeah, let's go do that. And then later you, you realize, you know, they build the insurance company, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And unfortunately, my mother passed away a few years later, and everybody wants to do what's best for their mom. Right. Uh, but you realize, you know, if I would have had to make the choice on a medical basis, I mean, she was already pretty much, you know, not wheelchair bound, but, in, you know, she had Alzheimer's, so it wasn't like she was allowed to walk around without us walking her. And, you know, it probably didn't make much of a difference because we couldn't work it out. You know, exercise her, you know, it might have actually been worse than better. So it's things like that that I think because consumers aren't forced to make a choice that end right. up costing taxpayers and businesses more. I say if you make everybody a little more culpable to it, I, well, some of those costs will go down on each end. If you actually made people pay for some of this stuff, they probably wouldn't run to the emergency room every every visit if they actually had, to, you know, some responsibility to it. But when you're saying that the government or your job is going to pay for it, they don't care. That's yeah, and I, and I think, look, it's just uh, if we had a shop about, uh, you know, what does it cost for a checkup? Um, you know, do we go to a, a local clinic uh, versus a, a hospital versus a doctor's office? I mean, you know, these ready care clinics can, can handle, you know, probably 80, 90 percent of what, what most people need at right. a fraction of the cost. And we just have no incentive to use that right now. Exactly. All right. Well, I mean, it, those are those are definitely some of the things that we, you know, as far as the health care, I think that opening up competition would be better. And like I said, the whole idea of healthy people paying for it, it, just, it seems like that's a bad idea. And if you don't pay for it, you could go to jail. I mean, that, like you said, that, that's right. probably... I mean, how, how, how can that be constitutional? Yeah. yeah, how can that even be constitutional? There's a, um, a Congressman Ryan is, is kind of leading the fight nationally on health care, and, and uh, he has some really good stuff out there with respect to, you know, what we could do to help bring costs down, to make it more affordable, to make it, uh, um, you know, get more people on there. And you have to remember, I mean, you know, when they talk about, you know, some 20 million people on him, you know, without uh, health insurance, um, estimates are about, 12 million of those are illegal immigrants. Uh, another 5 to 6 million, as many as 9 million, are basically young people, uh, many who don't need the insurance, so they don't want to get it, they don't want to pay for it because they're healthy. And, uh, you know, so in reality, you probably have about 5 million, you know, indigent poor. Well, if, if the problem's only 5 million people, why are we nationalizing the entire system to basically, you know, pay for or help 5 million people who really need it? I mean, we could probably come up with a way to you know, uh, put a credit on their food stamp uh, facility. I mean, what you know, there's ways to figure that out and address the problems that are necessary for those who truly need it and truly can't afford it. Um, you know, none of us want to pay for something we don't have to, but the reality is it's still going to cost us, 
through taxes, through loss of jobs, through making the system less competitive. And, you know, look, seven out of 10 jobs in the United States today are created by small businesses. So right. if we make it tougher for the entrepreneur to, um, you know, to, to run a restaurant, to, you know, put together a, um, you know, a, a furniture shop or a lumber yard or a real estate operation, all those things uh, cost money. And if you're required uh, to provide your employers with insurance that doesn't make sense or, you know, you price it in. I mean, everything you know, is, that's what's going to happen. Everything is I mean, out of whack. Less people get absolutely hired. Absolutely will. You know, less people are willing to invest in that company because they know all the other things that come along with it. Um, with our with our unemployment being, uh, being over 14%, is it safe to say that this uh, stimulus money that we got has not helped out Michigan too much? Well, part of the problem is there's there's a bunch of different types of funds that the stimulus money has come and gone in and out of, and I think that part of it is is the fact that you know we're concerned about um, you know how much of it is a loan, how much do we have to give back. Um, other times, you know, money came in with the understanding that you would spend uh, additional monies to make it um, you know to kind of make it worth its while. So what you were what you were finding very quickly was that you know we were matching dollars to spend them just to get additional dollars and that that you know that didn't necessarily do us any good i mean we had some short term fixes and and not necessarily again dealing with some of the long term problems that we're going to face so you know we pumped in some money i think we're we put ourselves in debt we used some of that stimulus money to basically cover shortfalls in state government um that allowed us to stay away from some of those structural reforms so instead of you know, restructuring, uh, you know, different departments and, and either, you know, moving some people around. We were able to hang on to them for another year or two. Um, all of that's going to cost us again because we didn't deal with it. We just kind of put off the problem to another year rather than handling it. So I think the stimulus money was probably a mixed bag. Uh, there was probably some good things it did, but uh, it may have, you know, given us just as many problems. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to have to deal with those things um, down the line rather than, you know, than, than now, and it's going to become more expensive and, and, and tougher for us. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about the, um, let's talk about the Michigan political scene here. we got a lot of interesting things going on this year. Uh, got the governor's race. We have a lot, of, like, like you said earlier, we have a lot of good candidates. Uh, Rick Snyder, Pete Hoekstra, Michael Cox, Michael Bouchard. Um, is there anybody else that you see out there as, out of those gubernatorial candidates that I miss anybody, or who do you who impresses you the most out of those guys? Well, I, I think I think uh, all of them have uh, different strengths and weaknesses, and and are really going to you know kind of present Republicans with a tremendous opportunity to look at some choices, and and uh, you know you take a look at you know, probably the leading candidate right now is uh, Attorney General Mike Cox, uh, who's run statewide before several times. Um, you know, had raised the most money uh, with respects to actually raising money and not putting it in. Um, right. You know, is known as kind of a tough-nosed conservative leader. Uh, you know, in tough times, an ex-Marine is 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 often the kind of guy you you, you look at. Um, you know, you take a look at Sheriff Mike Bouchard out of Oakland County. Again, somebody who's been in the state senate, uh, somebody who's actually been an administrator in a county. Um, you know, understand some of the challenges, ran for the U.S. Senate last time around. So, again, you know, offering some unique opportunities. And I think, you know, I think as you, as you look around at the, the various candidates and the programs that they're putting forth, um, we're having a pretty, you know, a pretty good debate. I mean, we are, uh, each of these guys are coming out and talking about, um, you know, putting forth their plans. Uh, I, I think that, you know, from a Republican perspective, it's, it's, it is important that they, are willing to at least take a look at um, issues that are important to us. So we, we talked about right to work. We talk about lowering taxes, lowering the regulatory uh, situation in, in Michigan, investing in education and making sure we move forward there, uh, making the reforms necessary to keep us at the top and have some of the best health care uh, that's out there and available. Uh, I think all the Republicans, if I'm not mistaken, have now agreed to a, a minimum of a two-year um, budget rather than a one-year budget. Um, right. We're oftentimes pushing off problems, you know, into the next year rather than dealing them this, you know, in the current year. So if all of a sudden you force people to go into a two-year budgeting process, we would take a little longer-term view at unemployment, tax revenues, et cetera, and you'd probably kind of smooth out the um, uh, the tax and spend cycle uh, for state government, and I think that would be healthy. 
So I, I think there's been some very, very good discussions. And um, I think, you know, look, we've had eight years of Jennifer Granholm. We've had the highest unemployment in the country with the Democrats, you know, controlling uh, the governorship and the House. Uh, they, they'd shoved through the largest tax increase in Michigan's history. We've lost so many jobs, so many people. I think the people in Michigan are ready for a change. So my guess is that we will be electing a Republican uh, in November in Michigan. Uh, people are going to be looking for somebody who's going to be, you know, kind of a, make some of those tough decisions, uh, right. somebody who's going to worry about the taxpayer. And, uh, you know, it's been a while since we had a governor that was more concer- you know, that was more concerned with the taxpayers who actually pay the bills than those who seem to be living off the government. Right. Well said. Well said. Um, m- moving forward, what are some of the who are some of the uh, local guys that are fighting fighting a good fight for the Michigan citizens in D.C. Some of our congressmen, just so people who are listening, uh, at least know that we do have some guys that are out there. Uh, oh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if if uh, you know, we were lucky here this week. They announced that uh, Congressman Dave Camp from Midland was uh, put on the, um, uh, the Budget Reduction Committee. There were six members, Republicans nationwide, appointed uh, to serve on this budget committee that the president put together, and, and uh, Michigan got a representative with respect to Congressman Dave Camp, who is the ranking member of the Ways and Means Committee on the Republican side. So that's a, you know, that's a real big coup for us, and, and, that, and he will be a very big player. Uh, you've got uh, Congressman Thaddeus McCotter, who is the chairman of the House Policy Committee. That's the number four ranking uh, member in the House. He serves the Western Wayne County area. Uh, he's been out there fighting on, you know, standing up for Republican principles, and yet is kind of given this common sense, um, you know, somebody who comes from, uh, you know, kind of a blue collar background and understands, you know, what I always, you know, refer to. I mean, where I came from. You know, I grew up in the city of Detroit, and you know, was probably one of the classic Reagan Democrat types, you know, uh, culturally conservative, uh, you know, believed in, in, you know, hard work and the values that are there. And that's why we have so many union members that are Republican in Michigan. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh you know, kind of, my dad used to call them the God guns and guts Republicans. And, and it was, you know, folks that worked with him at Fort, you know, Fisher body Fort street for 32 years. And they thought of themselves as Democrats because that's what they were supposed to be, but oftentimes voted for, uh, Republicans and, especially with Ronald Reagan kind of came over. So, you know, Thad Makata represents that kind of group. Uh, you know, we got Congresswoman Candace Miller up in Macomb County who's been doing a phenomenal job. I mean, um, you know, she was fighting the fight on, on some of the reforms that uh, uh, were taking place with respect to spending and, and uh, uh, military closures. I mean, she sits on the Armed Services Committee, and, you know, we've got Selfridge Air, Air Force Base and some other places. So she was, you know, done a great job there. And then, you know, Mike Rogers, who, who represents part of Oakland County and kind of runs along that Livingston County border and, and, and out into mid-Michigan here in Lansing. Right. Uh, again, another very strong, uh, you know, strong leader, uh, someone who's been very aggressive uh, on the House committees in general, um, oftentimes looked at as somebody who's going to move up in leadership and I think has a real bright future. Uh, so, you know, Michigan's got, we're very well represented in Congress. Uh, I think that you know, a lot of people are already looking at, you know, who's going to run in 2010 against Debbie Stabenow. I mean, that's our next shot at the U.S. Senate. Right, right now, uh, you know, Debbie Stabenow and Carl Levin hold the two Michigan seats, both held by Democrats. Uh, but I think that uh, you're going to see, you know, probably some pretty strong candidates emerge here after the 2008 election or 2010 election. I think it's going to be a good year for us nationally, and I, I hope it translates into a good year here in Michigan. Right. And then in 2012, I think that, uh, you know, Debbie Stabenow is going to be in for, for a fight of her life. And, you know, I, I think you'll see some pretty strong Republicans emerging from around the state. Challenger. I believe so, too. What do you believe the uh, effect of the Tea Party has been uh, as far as the, the GOP? Is, do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? Just overall, the the political climate, what is the uh, Tea Party, what is the effect has that been? I think it's been a very good thing. I mean, uh, I've, I've actually gone to uh, – Four Tea Party events here in Michigan. Uh, I was at the one at the state capitol, which was probably the largest they had here in Michigan. Over 5,000 people attended. Um, you know, and I, I knew the Tea Party organizers. I'd actually gone up on the steps of the capitol and kind of looked out over the crowd. And I can honestly say, I don't know if I recognized 20 or 30 Republicans. And I was still the Republican chairman at the time when they had the first Tea Party there. And, um, you know, I walked out in the crowd and talked to some of the people. And these were just average Americans, taxpayers, who were just sick and tired of what was going on in government and over taxes and, 
you know, too much spending and, and it sounded like, you know, Congress wasn't listening to what the people, you know, had to say. And so I, I think it's been a really healthy um, kind of fresh blood into the political process. Uh, these are independent voters. These are people who do not consider themselves Republicans or Democrats. Right. Uh, they, they just, they're, you know, they believe in the Constitution. They believe in limited government. Uh, they want to have honest politicians who, you know, do what they say and say what they're going to do. And um, I think it's been very healthy. I think they're holding people's feet to the fire. Uh, I think they're coming out and demonstrating and letting people know what they what they feel on health care, on taxes, on spending. Um, you know, if you take a look at, uh, I know within the Republican Party, many of them have decided to kind of participate from within and, and join the Republican Party. Uh, you and I were both over at the Conservative Political Action Conference out in Washington. There were a lot of Tea Party people who came there. Uh, and again, I think that just, you know, look, America is a center-right nation. You know, we're made up of probably 50 to 70 percent of Americans consider themselves, you know, somewhat conservative in one way or the other. And that doesn't right. necessarily mean Republican, but basically they share our conservative values, our, you know, limited government, pro-family, uh, you know, kind of a traditional hard work type of ethic. Right. And that bodes well, and I think the Tea Party people, most of them are coming from that angle. So it's just, you know, I don't think they're going to be joining any party per se. I think it's going to be more based on individual candidates. I think they're going to be looking for people who represent their views, people who they feel they can trust, people who are going to go to Washington and Lansing and, and kind of fight the fight. So I, I think the Tea Party movement is extremely healthy. I think it's going to mean – a stronger conservative movement across America, and particularly here in Michigan. Um, I think people ought to, you know, like anybody who's willing to get involved in politics, and I don't really think it matters if you get involved on the right or the left. I think it's just important to get involved. Right. Uh, now, I think, you know, obviously, I think the conservatives have the, the better ideas and the right way of moving forward, and, you know, I don't want to become a Europe. Uh, I don't want to socialize our system. I don't want government you know, running uh, our lives and becoming a nanny state. Um, and so I, I believe in those conservative principles, and I think the Tea Party people are going to be a big part of that for many, many years to come. So I encourage them. I'm excited to have them part of it. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I hope they get involved in both the Republican and the Democratic Party because the Democrats could sure use some uh, fresh new ideas. Too. Yeah, they could. <laughs> As we, 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 we miss uh, those conservative Joe. Democrats. Yeah, they, they need some new ideas over there. Um, a lot of the values you just named, uh, you know, family, conservative values, um, essentially are some of the same values that you have um, in the African-American community. I mean, I'm sure you faced those challenges before. What do you think we can do uh, to expand that message um, into the urban communities as far as schools of choice? I mean, there's a lot of different issues that we could touch upon that can, can connect those dots. Uh, what do you think we can do to better uh, you know, bring that together so people can see the conservative values. Um, even if you're, you know, right now you might be disenfranchised, that doesn't mean you'll be disenfranchised forever. And the idea of working hard and, um, you know, and gaining these things and better, you know, and improving yourself. What do you think we can do to actually, you know, bring that message, uh, hit it, you know, make it bring it home more for the urban communities? Well, I, I agree. I, I think that if you take a look at the African American community in general. Um, it is very much a conservative community. I mean, they believe in strong family units, uh, very hardworking, entrepreneurial. And I think part of our challenge as Republicans in particular uh, and conservatives in general is that we have to reach out to those communities. We have to, you know, go into the communities and, and talk to people about where we are in the issues and what the politics are. And I think what the Democrats did is they very effectively co-opted the African-American community to believe that the Democrats better represented their views, and I think that that's you know basically wrong. Um, we went uh, when I was chairman of the Republican Party um, for a couple of years, uh, I think three years in a row. We sponsored Juneteenth Day, uh, celebrating the Emancipation Proclamation, and set up these uh, events throughout Michigan and African American communities. And we didn't announce that they were Republican events; we just called them Juneteenth Day. And I'd show up, and we talked about you know, Republicans' role in civil rights. We talked about the fact that the first 16 members of Congress who happened to be African-American were black, were Republican. Uh, right. The first U.S. senators were African-Americans. 
uh, who are Republican. Uh, you know, the history of the Republican Party and the history of African Americans has been, uh, and 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 their civil rights and their rights in general have been very closely tied. But right. unfortunately, uh, in the '60s and during some, you know, uh, you know, at a tough time in in our history, uh, the Democrats took advantage of it. And so. We now have to come back and prove ourselves. Um, I think it is going to be a long-term process. I think it's a reaching out process. Um, you've got to have open dialogue. Um, I'm often amazed that, you know, going into African American churches or, or meeting with ministers or their, or their congregation or doing other shows that you'll find people that would agree with you on almost every issue. And then they say, well, but I can't vote Republican. I'm, I'm a Democrat. Exactly. And you say, why? And they say, well, I don't know. I'm just a Democrat. And, you know, I think, I grew up in an ethnic neighborhood, and I always thought I was a Democrat until I kind of figured it out and started paying closer attention. So I think it's our job to reach out, uh, to talk to more people, to educate people, uh, to have these discussions. And uh, I think you're going to find, you know, more and more people that, uh, again, as you said, you know, pro-life, uh, pro-traditional family, schools of choice, entrepreneurship, uh, good educations. Uh, you know, um, traditional families. I mean, these are things that are shared by the overwhelming majority of uh, right. the African American community. I mean, it's a very religious community. It's a very united community. Um, uh, there is the the sense of family there, and and I think that is very much right up our alley. It's right. just that we haven't done a good job of communicating that or reaching out uh, to the community in general and letting them both feel and understand uh, that we share the same values and that we're, uh, uh, you know, we ought to be working together with respect to our political needs. Right. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I, like I said, uh, I, I, I constantly, um, you know, being, I'm from Detroit. I'm always trying to, you know, I'm at the barbershop. I get ragged for being a Republican, but I try to explain to them the connection. And uh, a lot of times, a lot of people just don't know um, of, the, of the history. And I think a lot of it's through the media that they made sure that we don't, understand uh, the history of what's going on between the, the GOP and the African-American community. But uh, moving forward, we just all, like I said, we have to do a better job of reaching out and maybe not just doing it, you know, at election times, but all through the through the whole cycle. Absolutely. See that, uh, it's not just for the votes because, like I said, that's that's kind of like what the Democrats, they've taken that for granted. And uh, they, like I said, at this point, uh, they vote 90% of the time with uh, the Democrats blindly, meaning that they're not even thinking about it. So we right. just have to do a better well, job. Reaching out to them. and and I you know I, I I spoke to a group of ministers and and some community leaders in Detroit one one night and we were talking about it and I said look even if you wanted to look at it from a selfish standpoint uh, it would make sense for the African American community to purposely say we want to divide our community and make the Democrat and Republican parties compete for our vote More right level. now Republicans feel very <laughs> frustrated and saying that it doesn't matter how hard we work we're only going to get ten percent of the vote. And the Democrats say it doesn't matter how hard we work, we're going to get 90% of the vote. So the Democrats get to take the African-American community for granted, and the Republicans say, well, we'll reach out to as much as we can, but we're not going to do too much because we know where the votes are going to fall. Where if it was a more competitive uh, environment politically, if people were to come out and say, look, come out and earn my vote, convince me who's right or wrong, uh, treat it in a more open process so that Republicans, A, would feel they had a chance to win, and B, Democrats felt they had a you know, uh, earn their support to win and not take it for granted, uh, in general, it would be, it would make political sense for the community. Right, right. Well, I, that, it makes a lot of sense. We just, like you said, got to step up, step up a little bit more and make it work a little bit harder. And we'll definitely, like I said, by at least by 2012, we can try to shift some of that around. Like I said, the political leverage, we just don't, it's none in the African-American community, so... Hopefully uh, they're listening and moving forward. They can definitely, like I said, listen, listen to both parties instead of just shutting out one side of it. So, Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show here. I'm going to leave the lines open. If you're listening and you want to call in and ask a question, uh, the call-in number is 347-996-3175. I'm only going to keep Saul on the line for a few moments here. Um, I thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, it, it's been a great experience. I, I, I want to hopefully I'll have you on again. We can go through these uh, the political races as they start to heat up over the uh, you know over the summer. Because like I said, we got the uh, attorney general attorney general race. I have Mike Bishop on here in a couple weeks, so I can say that'll I'll, be I'll great. Yep. Yeah, well, I mean we're gonna we're gonna elect an attorney general, a secretary of state, obviously the governor and lieutenant governor. 
We have our entire state Senate is up. The entire state House is up this time. And every congressman is up. We just don't have any races for the U.S. Senate. So we're going to have a very full political year, a uh, very exciting time to be uh, involved in politics. And uh, I just, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're doing this, uh, uh, you know, the show and, and talking about Michigan specifically. And, and I think that there's just, uh, you know, there's a lot your listeners can learn. And, and um, you know, I hope they take advantage of the, the opportunity to, you know, hear from some different speakers and, and um, you know, ask some questions and, and get a better idea of what's going on in the political world out there. Right. Well, people, if you're listening in, uh, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm only going to have a song on the line for a moment here. 347-996-3175 is the call-in number. And, again, it's 347-996-3175. I'm going to go over to the chat room real quick to see if we've got anybody in there. Got a couple people guest guest speakers here. Anybody? Let me see if I get anybody to chime in with us here. All right. So when are you heading back out to DC, Saul? Well, I'm I'm probably going to go out uh, again. Uh, I'm supposed to. I'm actually waiting for a meeting we're trying to uh, set up with uh, Chairman Steele here for this week uh, on some technology issues we're working on. So we've been uh, trying to get his schedule, and obviously. Scheduling meeting with the chairman is not easy. He's traveling all over the country, uh, giving speeches, raising money, firing up the troops, and getting ready for this, you know, the election cycle coming up. So it's a, um, you know, it's a it's a it's a busy time and an exciting time. But uh, we've got the Southern Leadership Conference coming up in in uh, two weeks down in New Orleans, and uh, I'm still trying to uh, see if I can scale a couple of days to get away from there. It's going to be spring break, so it's going to I have to choose between finishing off with the family or doing that. So I think I might went out with the kids on the beach instead. But that <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. That sounds real good to me. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, the call lines have been kind of quiet tonight. I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap up the show here. I really thank you for coming on. Um, and uh, if you got, want to give them your website for your blog, for anybody that's listening out here, and uh, like I said, they can check you out on there also and follow you on Twitter. Absolutely. If you if you go to uh, that's Saul folks, uh, kind of like that's all folks, the old cartoon thing, but with a Saul. So it's that's Saul uh, folks. dot com is my uh, uh, blog uh, that I post on weekly and and sometimes a couple times a week with just interesting articles and things that are happening. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at s anuzis. So that's s a n u z i s. Um, we've got some little over fourteen thousand. Uh, followers and friends there, and, and we're always sharing you know the latest news articles and what's happening politically. So it's a good place to drop by and get information if you're interested in conservative, Republican, national, and and and, and Michigan politics as well. And then uh, if you just uh, go on Facebook and type in a news this, you can a n u z i s. It'll take you to my um, Facebook pages. And unfortunately, I've I've hit the maximum on my friends on my on my uh, personal page, but I created a fan page now and get more people on there just because they don't have a limit. So we talk about the exact same things on both pages. I keep them both open at once and post the same thing on both pages. So you can uh, you can join us there and, and just keep track of what's going on with Republican politics, conservative politics, kind of a national conservative movement, as well as, as some Michigan politics as well. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on, and um, I look forward well, great to, to be with you, Wayne. So Thanks for having me. I don't know if I'm going to be down in New Orleans again. Again. Like I said, that's I was supposed to go to D.C. this week, but I, uh, it's, the scheduling is kind of crazy right now. But I really thank you for coming on, and uh, I look forward to having you on again soon. Sounds good. Well, thanks for having me. Take care now. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Well, that was Saul. He was on this evening. I appreciate that. Uh, folks, if you were listening in tonight, I hope you're listening to all the different issues that uh, we're facing here in Michigan I mean, some of the same issues uh, throughout the country as far as some of the, the employment issues. Um, as far as this health care debate, I encourage you all to call your Congress members uh, and your senators if they're thinking about changing their minds. Call in. Uh, stay, stay vigilant on this because uh, these are the kind of issues that uh, affect every state, not just in Michigan. Um, um, if my Michigan, if you got my Michigan listeners, give me a call tonight. I want to hear from you. I want to hear what do you think we can do to fix Michigan, what we can do to make it better, 347-996-3175. I want to hear from you. The number is 347-996-3175. I 
Moses, I'll be on the air for a few more minutes, so I would love to hear from you before I go off the air. Uh, next week's show, I will have Paul Welday on. He's running for Congress here in uh, in Michigan. And the week after that, I will have Senate Leader Mike Bishop on the show, and I'm waiting for some other confirmations uh, for the following Fix Michigan Mondays, but um, I, I plan on bringing you uh, leaders throughout the bit in the political realm, also in the uh, business realm, and also possibly from the nonprofit organizations some, as far as some of the people that help with the charter schools, because we got, I want to bring all different kind of people in from different angles to give ideas and solutions on what we can do to fix Michigan. Um, again, this is a state I was born and raised in, and um, again, a lot of people, when I graduated, I didn't plan on leaving Michigan at the time, but uh, things have changed a lot over since I've graduated from school, and uh, when you hear that over 60% of the kids that are, you know, our future, they don't plan on staying here, um, it, it, it does give you, it, it paints a bleak picture. So um, I'd like to hear from the people tonight that were listening, 347-996-3175. Again, we're on Fix Michigan Mondays. I want to hear from you. Let me go. I'm going to go back on Twitter and see what I, see what kind of feedback I'm getting. Again, part of the issue that I have, uh, we're trying to bring awareness uh, to this show is to give people options and to make people feel like they're involved. So I encourage you to give give me a call three four seven nine nine six three one seven five. E. Coleman, you just sent me a text message with question marks. If you got questions, give me a call on the show, man. I got ten minutes left. Three four seven nine nine six three one seven five. You got questions? I got answers. Call in number. Three four seven nine nine six three one seven five. Again, I'll be. Uh, I was planning on to DC this week uh, for the Fe- Frederick Douglass Leadership Conference. Uh, scheduling. I'm still not a hundred percent sure I'm going to make it there, but I'm hoping we can make it there. Um, as far as fixing Michigan, we have a lot of work to do here in Michigan. Um, I think the biggest thing, and again, we talked about, I talked about Saul, is, is jobs. Jobs in Michigan should be number one. Um, I think a lot of ways we can improve the whole job situation here in Michigan, obviously, is uh, with less regulation. Uh, we didn't really talk about a lot, but the Michigan business tax. Uh, we're a heavily taxed state, and I think there's maybe we looked at uh, removing the Michigan business tax, uh, allowing, again, allowing. Uh, the choice of the worker, if he wants to support or be part of the union, uh, those would be the kind of things that would make it more advantageous to do to do business in Michigan. Uh, there's no question that with a 14% unemployment rate, that uh, the biggest issue in Michigan is not um, health care but jobs. Uh, a lot of good health care will do us if you know people aren't working and people are going to be leaving Michigan. So um, we have a lot of work to do. E. Coleman, if you're listening out there, I saw that you just sent me a question mark. Give me a call here. I want to hear from you, 347-996-3175. I'm going off the air real soon, so I need. To, I want to hear from you. If you don't have any calls, I'll be going off the air very shortly here. Let's see. So you guys got to, if you're listening on the show, I'm looking at all these questions you guys sent me. If you're um, listening on the show, send them to me Um. On, on the chat room, because some of these questions I could have asked Saul about the term limits. I'm sorry I didn't get to ask while he was on the show, but uh, maybe if Saul is still in the, uh, in the chat room, let me see if he's in there. Uh, welcome, Saul. If you're in the chat room and you're still listening, Saul, uh, I had someone ask me a question about term limits. Let me give you the question. Uh, what are your insights on term limits in Michigan? If you're still listening, go ahead and uh, put it on the live chat room. And if you're again, if you're listening on the show, everyone join the chat room and we can still talk about it. What are your uh, thoughts tonight? Uh, what are your thoughts, Saul, on uh, term limits? If you're listening still and you're in the chat room.
chat room. All right, people. Well, I tell you what, I'm gonna um, I'm going off the air soon here. I want to thank everyone that was listening in. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Uh, give me your feedback on that, whether it be on Twitter uh, or am I going to Ustream broadcast later this evening just for a little while to talk Michigan politics. But I thank you for listening in this evening. All right, hold on, I got a call here. See, someone called in just when I was about to head off. Caller, you on the air? Caller. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Pretty good. This is the Lanhamheimer. I'm sorry. Lanhamheimer. We we follow each other on uh, Twitter. Uh, all right. How you doing this evening? Pretty good. Uh, you want to talk about about uh, health care or jobs? Well, we were, and we were talking about in Michigan. The bigger issue probably would be uh, jobs. But I mean, you what do you want to talk about? Health care, jobs. Well, bigger well issue I just I've been what I've been thinking lately is. Um, the way that a lot of people are um, coming off with the the way that they feel um, about the president and what he's doing and stuff right now, do they really want him to create jobs or help them to promote jobs, or or what what do you think is the best alternative for helping the private? Um, Part you can of put, America you, getting you, put a, you can put the the um, a, a culture in place where it's advantageous for these guys to do business. I don't think you can really count on the government to create jobs, but you can. They can create a system, or they can create the atmosphere where businesses and jobs can flourish. Uh, with obviously with less taxes, that encourages uh, uh, employers to invest more in the company. They if they, if, if they can. Uh, Plain and simple, if a business can go somewhere else, pay less taxes, and bring more money into the business, they're going to do that. So I think that, it, you know, from that standpoint, if the government wants to get involved, uh, you can just make it more, uh, like I said, make it an easier setup for businesses to flourish as opposed to putting in more regulations like cap and trade and these kind of things where you're actually making it harder to do business in America than you are in these competing countries like China where they're, they they don't have nearly as much regulation. The cost of work is cheaper, uh, and that's why we're losing out jobs to a lot of these other countries. So, so what? So what would? So let me see here. Um, all right. So it's plain and simple. It's just it's, if if we want to create more businesses here, if we want to create more jobs in America, uh, you, you you have to. Again, take less taxes. I mean, that that starts with when you talk about businesses in America and, and small businesses, and again, creating creating policies that make it easy to stay in business and not necessarily um, not necessarily punishing the person that again makes the money. You know, and it's almost become a bad thing to be a capitalist as a person that actually has made money with it, whether it be investing or whatever. Uh, stop making that person the bad guy and allow that person to reinvest. Create these jobs and that sort of thing. So, so what's your what's your take on on George Bush's administration? He he put um, tax tax cuts for for the wealthy, and I, I I'm sure that you and I both have liberal friends. Okay, um, and when I'm talking to some of them, they're talking about how it just helped the rich get richer, and if you go after the rich people. You're gonna, in essence, you're going to lose um, employees, and you're gonna lose good businesses. Oh yeah, yeah I'm, on, I I'm agree. on the phone here. Hello? Can you hear Hello? me there? I'm on the phone, mom, and it's a live program. <laughs> yeah, mom, he's on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but I mean, do do you get where I'm coming from, though? Yeah, um, and again, that's I can think that's the, um, the struggle on that is to say that if you don't give those tax breaks to the wealthy to create and invest in those jobs, again, you're not going to get a, a job from a poor person. I think Newt Gingrich said that best. So, um, and I'm and I'm running out of time here. I wish you to call in about a couple minutes early. I only got 30 seconds left on the show. If you want to join me in the chat room, man, we can uh, chat a little bit longer on there. Uh, but I'm about to go off the air on my show. I've got 20 seconds left. Okay. All right. But thanks for calling in, and I'll be on again tomorrow night at 10 o'clock Eastern. So if you want to call in tomorrow, please listen in, and we can talk some more, okay? All right, man. Thanks a lot. All right.
Thanks for everybody that was listening in this evening. Uh, this is Wayne Bradley, and I'm signing off for the first Fix Michigan Monday. God bless you, and good night.